connect with another person. And then last of all, the emotion that all of us strive for and all of us seek for is the emotion of happiness. Um, I'll talk about happiness a little bit and then get into the, the other emotions. Is that happiness is an emotion that all of us want. If I'm gonna talk about the Christian community specifically, every Christian person wants to experience happiness. But there's been an uncomfortable history with the concept of happiness. Um, I've heard many speakers and many teachers try to differentiate between happiness and differentiate between joy, saying that Christians are not supposed to be happy, they're supposed to have joy. The problem with that is that um, if I was going to ask you, if I give you a thousand dollars, would it make you happy? And you have some bills to pay. Um, if your concept is that Christians shouldn't be happy, then you should say, no, that won't make me happy. So then I don't give you the thousand dollars. But at the end of the day, joy and happiness um, are both emotions that you can feel. And they have different, um, pretty much joy and happiness are, in my perspective, the same emotion that you can feel. But I think where people have challenges is, is that some people have joy in evil things and some people have joy in, in positive things. And we try to differentiate those two types of joy by using the two words separately. But at the end of the day, joy and happiness in our culture are the same exact word. So when it comes to joy and happiness, I think that you can begin to develop a concept of what it means to express your emotions and to understand the purpose of emotions. I think the purpose of emotions are to express um, how we're feeling, yes, but the purpose of emotions are also to define who we are. Our emotional response to external stimuli actually define who we are. But more so, not only defining who we are, our emotional response actually um, doesn't just come from our own thoughts or our own heart. Our emotional responses come from our reaction to another entity. I don't want to be too complicated here, but it's like this. A person who is happy that they shot another person that emotion of happiness and that adrenaline of happiness, some people will challenge and say they don't feel happy, but at the end of the day, that positive feeling that they feel, they have that feeling um, from a root cause of evil, that they, that they enjoy evil, so that makes them happy. But on the other hand, a person you know um, who, who has their newborn baby in their hand, and you have that feeling of euphoria, that feeling of joy that comes upon you. That person that has that feeling of joy that's coming on them, um, that comes from a source. It comes from, it comes from um, the collective understanding in our world from goodness. I would say it comes from God. So when we were talking about our emotions, our emotions have sources. And when you get back to the source of our emotion, then that's where you have a clearer picture of what emotions are. Emotions are the expression of our heart towards others and ultimately the expression of our heart towards God. So as a human being, we experience all five of these emotions. We experience, um, we experience fear, we experience anger, we experience disgust, we experience sadness, we experience happiness, we experience all of these. But the source of what we're experiencing um, changes. Even within a Christian life, sometimes I'm happy about good things and sometimes I'm happy about bad things. But at the end of the day, when I begin to evaluate where my happiness is coming from, it comes from a source. When something bad happens to my enemy and I feel good about it and I start to giggle, you know, and I feel um, excited about it, that doesn't come from the heart of God, but it is a human expression or human experience of happiness. So we do experience happiness. 
um, in evil when our happiness is not rooted in God. But on the other hand, when, you know, um, a friend of yours is blessed, you know, um, maybe their life has been transformed by experience with God and now they've given their heart to God and you're excited about it and you're happy for them. That happiness comes from a source and that source is goodness and that source is God. So at the end of the day, when it comes to happiness, happiness has a source and all emotions have a source. And it's our response to God that indicates our emotional response to certain situations. So let's go through it, fear. If I am living a life um, fearful of other people, I'm fearful and I'm frustrated and I'm fearful um, of, of just living. God created me to have courage. The Bible says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So what exactly is fear? Fear is that feeling of, of terror or that feeling of, of, of trying to avoid hurt or that, or that, um, that automatic feeling to run or to protect oneself from harm. So when I now use that feeling to separate myself from having deep, meaningful relationships, to separate myself from God, to separate myself from being a part of a church community, to separate myself for, from just going out and living my life, that kind of fear obviously has a root that doesn't come from God. That kind of fear is a negative fear. That's the fear that you allow the enemy to put into your heart, that you cannot trust God, you cannot trust yourself. It's a fear that's absent of trust. Whereas on the other hand, if I'm driving down the street and the semi truck is coming toward my car and it's about to hit me, um, my mind tells me to swerve away because I wanna live. Living and the desire to live is actually um, one of the purposes of having fear. So it's okay to have fear so long as fear causes me to live. So it's very important um, for us to, to get to a place where we evaluate our fear. Sometimes when I'm fearful, it's not a bad thing. If you're gonna, if you're gonna go in front of people and you're gonna preach, there should be a measure of fear because you're trying to speak on behalf of God and you don't wanna make a mistake. If you're going to a job interview and they're gonna interview you, there should be a level of fear um, because um, you wanna prepare yourself for that opportunity. So at the end of the day, fear is a human emotion that has some positives to it because it causes you to focus and it causes you to, to prepare yourself for what's coming. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, all I'm really saying is that every emotion that we have, positive and negative, if it's in the heart of a believer, and if a believer is, is susceptible to God, all of those emotions can become positive. So fear is that emotion that prepares me for something that's coming. So when it comes to um, anger, anger, sometimes we don't act if we're not angry. And what I find that's funny is that a lot of times throughout the Bible, the Bible warns us about being angry. But then on the other hand, you see God becoming angry. And then you also see sometimes people like Moses become angry at the people because they're not serving God. And the thing about it is that when you understand anger, anger, um, you become angry when someone offends you or when someone offends a principle that you believe in. So at the end of the day, if I'm following God and I'm trusting God, there are principles that God has that I believe in. So if a person is violating those principles, especially if a person is claiming to be a Christian and they're violating those principles, that should make me angry. Now, the reason why I talk about because earlier I was talking about the source, is that when I look at principles of God that are being violated by people who should be following them, that should elicit some kind of response of anger in me. But today, a lot of people are angry, not so much because people are violating what God is saying, but people are, 
are angry because others are violating their own, my own personal belief. And I'd like to say hello to Leah Jurai online. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If I'm not, just let me know. And today we're just talking about um, emotions, Leah, and just our thoughts on emotion. Like, what are emotions? And we're talking about um, right now that emotions have a source. It can either be God or it can either be the enemy. And of course, it comes out of our thoughts, it comes out of our own experiences. But at the end of the day, there are good parts of emotions and there are bad parts of emotions. So I'm so happy to have you, Leah. I'm happy to have you, Inspire and Charm. I'm happy to have everyone who's on the line. And for all of you who are watching right now, whether this is in the post production and you're able to comment, we're just talking about emotions. What are emotions to you? We want you to add to this conversation and we just want to begin to um, share and talk with each other. Also, if you don't know each other, feel free to connect with each other and say hello and, and talk to each other even as I'm talking. And if you wanna shout out and say amen, or if you wanna shout out and ask a question, or better yet, if you have a thought that you feel is really relevant that could help the community, please share it. I'd love for you to share. So I was talking about fear. Is that is that fear is not bad in itself. Um, and anger is not bad in itself. But when anger or fear or any emotion is not directed by God, then it becomes negative. So, so far I've been talking about God and the devil, God and the devil, God and the devil, God and the enemy, God and the enemy, and mostly about God. But at the end of the day, when you are having an emotional response that comes out of selfishness, you are having an emotional response that's probably rooted in darkness or rooted in the enemy. When you have an emotional response with God in mind, and especially with community in mind, um, then your response, even if it's traditionally considered a negative emotion is a good thing. So fear when a truck is coming at you is a good thing because it will cause you to move. Anger when somebody is violating the word of God is a good thing because it will cause you to live what the word of God is saying. I think there's even other areas of anger where, where, where you have community outrage. Like when, when someone does something, harm somebody, takes somebody's life, does something that's criminal in nature, we become frustrated because we understand that whatever that person is doing, it's not right. It's not right. So because we understand that it's not right, we stand up against it. So to me, when it comes to our emotions, we have to begin, begin to like look into it and have a better understanding of what exactly are emotions. And then as we look into it deeper, we can also begin to understand how to utilize our emotions. Today, we're just talking mostly about what emotions are. So anger can be selfish. Anger can be harmful because it can lead to violence. Anger can do a lot of things that are negative, but there are also good parts of anger. Anger can motivate you to go back to school. Anger can motivate you to believe in yourself when others don't believe in you. Anger can cause you to give your heart to God because you're angry and frustrated with the life that you're currently living and you want to have a transformed life. But at the end of the day, whatever emotion you're experiencing, you want to put it in the hand of God because any emotion that God has um, authority or control over will be for your good. So what about disgust? I think disgust is very similar to anger, um, but instead of you reacting out, you actually have an internal reaction. Um, it's like it's like an internal meter that causes you to think about things. I think from the physical realm, if you smell something that smells rank or something that smells bad, you become disgusted. But also if you see some behaviors of people that are just out of order, you can become disgusted. And I think that when you funnel through the spirit of God, your morality and your concepts and your beliefs, you become disgusted by a lot of things that people do. The more closer you get to God, you become disgusted by people who don't care about other people. People who are just about themselves, who are about 
uh, moving their life forward, even harming people to do that. You become disgusted because you recognize that that's not the heart of God. But on the other hand, um, what is a way that disgust can sometimes be used inappropriately? I think that when you look in the mirror and you look at yourself, <clears throat> no matter um, who you are, no matter what you look at, uh, like, and you become disgusted with yourself, not for the point of changing to become better, but for the point of just abusing yourself and causing your, your self-esteem to plummet, that's not good. It is not good for us to become disgusted with who we are because, because we are special people. We are special people and our lives matter. And because our lives matter, we should be disgusted with what God is disgusted with and we should be pleased with what God is pleased with. So when I look in the mirror, I see that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You may have a concept of what I am, but if it's good, that's nice, but it doesn't really matter because my concept of who I am is I am wonderful because God made me. And I think as human beings, we have to get to the place where we are not disgusted with who we are. If our life is going the way that God wants it to go, we should not be disgusted with our life. If we're doing the things that we should do, but we're not seeing the results that we want, we should not be disgusted with where we're going or with our or with our future. We should trust God. So disgust um, is another emotion that when funneled through God can be used to build us up. But obviously, if we um, allow disgust to enter our heart and God's not involved, it's going to do damage to us. I'm tired of hearing people, you know, tell me about all the things that are wrong about them or about others, being disgusted with a person because the person is more gifted than them. You know, um, you know, she can't sing. Yeah, she can sing. She has an album. Um, you don't have an album. Don't be disgusted with her and don't be disgusted with yourself. Maybe you were never meant to sing. And if you were meant to sing, have patience and celebrate those that are around you so that you can become a singer as well. Um, so many different examples that we can use, but at the end of the day, I'm convinced that no matter what the emotion is, that we can utilize that emotion if we, if we funnel it through a spirit of love. So we talked about fear, anger, disgust, sadness. Sadness is one of those experiences that we all want to avoid, that we all, that's very unpleasant. It's hard to see a positive as it relates to sadness. Like it's difficult. But at the end of the day, one of the best ways to experience sadness and be able to move forward is to have it in the proper context. So let me show you what sadness through God looks like. Sadness through God looks like this. When you have a mentor, a friend, a father or a mother, someone that you've bonded with, that there was so much love and that person dies, you've lost them. You will not see them again in this life. To have grief, to have sorrow, to have sadness, that's actually a good thing because it shows an appreciation for something that you had that was a gift that you no longer have the opportunity to have. Now saying that, you don't want to delve into despair. You don't want to get to the place where you begin to do things and become a person that that individual would be sad to see you become. You actually want to accomplish some of the tasks that, were, that was in them that you have the gift to accomplish. So if your mentor has passed and your mentor has a great love for the poor, Take it upon yourself to do some of that and to ultimately appreciate the gift that is them um, through your sadness. An inappropriate way of, of expressing sadness is, is once again coming from selfishness or coming from, for, for, from darkness is when I'm sad because all of my friends, you know, have a particular house and I don't have that house. And I'm crying and I'm saying, oh, my life is so horrible. I'm so worthless. Why, God, why would you not give me a blessing? Why would you not do this in my life? It seems like you're against me, God. That kind of sadness is, is counterproductive. 
Because if your friends are getting houses and you really want a house, that's an indication that you are in a network of people that can give you the information to help you to get your goal. So instead of being sad, you should be actually be happy. But the tough thing that we're having nowadays is that is that so many times we are we are fighting against false perceptions, fighting against beliefs that are not true, generating emotions in us that we don't need to generate. We're sad because we say we don't have any friends and our friend is sitting right beside us in our house and becoming highly offended and starting to reconsider being your friend because how can you say you have no friends and I'm in your house when you're sorrowful sitting beside you? It's happened to me many times. I know it's probably happened to you as well. But the thing you want to be careful of is that you're not the person doing it. I appreciate my life. There are some things in my life that make me sad. There's some things um, in my life that are challenging. There's some things in your life that will make you sad. There's some things that are challenging in your life. Um, another, another means of sadness that's legitimate is that when I'm trying to live for God and I, and I fall or I make errors, I should be sad about it. I shouldn't be sad to the point that I say, oh God, I just give up. I don't want to live anymore. No, you shouldn't be like that. You should have a joy that transcends your transgression. So you can ask God to forgive you. You can be saddened by your mistake, but now you trust God to restore you and to transform you. So at the end of the day, um, you can be sad and legitimately be disappointed with yourself. But anytime sadness is funneled through the spirit of God, it's done to transform you, either by appreciating something that you have lost or transforming something that needs change, which is generally ourselves. And then we get to happiness. Happiness is very, very, very important. We talked about happiness earlier, but I just want to talk about it again. Is that, is that happiness, when it is funneled through God, is that you begin to pray to God and you ask for God to anoint you. Another thought or another definition of anointing is purpose. Is that you ask God to live his purpose through you or to allow you to live your purpose for him. And when you begin to live daily for God, it fills you with a hope and a joy that even sometimes transcends circumstance. So it's very important for us to get to a place where we are filled with the joy of purpose because true happiness actually comes through God. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Jesus said that he wants to bless us until his joy is made full in us, until our joy is full. Throughout the scripture, the Bible over and over exhorts us to live in joy, to live in happiness, to have a peace that passes all understanding. The Bible says that we should be anxious for nothing, but we should have joy. Now, here's the thing about anxiety. And I know like so many people struggle with anxiety and I think it's a very serious situation. But if you're blessed not to be anxious, if you're blessed not to worry, um, one of the best ways to guard that is to get to the place where you appreciate life. Where when you're feeling sad, you don't allow sad to bring you to a place of sadness to bring you to a place of darkness. When you're feeling fearful, you don't allow fear to bring you to a place of darkness. When you're feeling um, disgusted, you don't allow the disgust to bring you to a place of anger. When you're feeling um, um, angry, you don't allow um, your flesh to bring you to a place of jealousy and envy, but in all of your feelings, positive and negative, you allow God to direct you. You allow love to direct you. You allow unselfishness to, to direct you. You begin to focus on your community instead of focusing on yourself. If you can do that, you can avoid anxiety. You can avoid uh, being anxious. You can avoid being worried. 
I didn't put worry and anxiety as as a major emotion because I think that it really comes out of the five major emotions that we talked about. Um, and if you can master those five without allowing them to become dark in your life, you don't really get into places of, of anxiety and depression. The thing I do feel sad about, especially for Christians, is that because we were taught to ignore our emotions or taught many different things about our emotions that are not true, so many people find themselves in a place of deep despair. Sometimes it could be a medical situation, like, you know, medically there's an imbalance and, you, and you're just not thinking the way that you want to think. And in those cases, people take medication. But I, of, but I oftentimes believe that many people get to that place of imbalance because they live life filled with all kinds of negative emotions and they live life filled with negative emotions that actually um, are sponsored by the enemy. You see, a lot of times our negative emotions start out by us looking for our own will or looking for our own selfishness, looking for something that benefits us, what's in it for me. And that's how it usually starts. But if you're living in negativity long enough, it moves from what's in it for me to the devil trying to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. So one of the keys of, of mastering our emotions is to understand what emotions are. And emotions generally are generated from a source, like I said earlier. And then, and then depending on the source that we are focused on, then we have a stimulus or we have something happen in our life and it invokes a response in us. And then when we respond, we see what's in our heart. So if I see that God is working in my life and things are going well, then obviously you want to keep on that track. If, if I see that, you know, there's some things that are not right, I'm jealous of a person, um, and because I'm jealous of them, that's why I'm angry, you got to let go of the jealousy. I'm disgusted of a person because I have unforgiveness in my heart. You got to forgive the person. And at the end of the day, we have to evaluate our emotions because most of our negative emotions are not coming out of positive mindset. So this is just kind of the beginning of a conversation because later on I want to move into more in-depth thoughts around, around emotion because at the end of the day, the apex of what I want to talk about moving forward is happiness, is that happiness is what God wants you to have. And a lot of times people will come against me and won't even listen to what I'm saying or, or come against the thought of happiness for a Christian and say that it's the last days, the devil is supposed to take over. And you know what? All that stuff sounds good until you see Paul and Peter and Barnabas and Thomas and Bartholomew and Jesus and going to the Old Testament. You see David and Moses and Abraham. And you see that there is there is a calmness in their spirit. These people are not devastated. These people are not talking about how they don't know if God's real. These people are not talking about how their life is ruined and how life is horrible. These people have a happiness on the inside. It's right there in the scriptures. You don't see people who are who are completely lost, atheistic in their mindset, trying to figure out who God is in the Bible. These people are going through very, very difficult times, very hard times, but they find a peace in the midst of those hard times. So the reason why I'm talking about this is because there's a happiness that you can have that is not circumstantial. The happiness that you can have is to be in the will of God, is to be the kind of person that you know you're supposed to be, to understand, first of all, your identity. You understand who you are. When a person understands who they are, and then they understand um, where they belong, they understand their community, and then they understand their purpose, why they are alive, what they're supposed to do, and they're actively doing it, that person is going to be happy. I look at someone like Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, people want to kill the guy. He ultimately was, he ultimately died for his belief, but at the end of the day, there's a happiness about him, even though he had all that danger around him, because he understood that my life has purpose. And there are so many people that, um, you know, 
don't have any enemies because in order to have enemies, you got to do something, you know? Um, there's no one that really dislikes them. Sometimes economically, financially, they're doing pretty good and everything is in place and they are so broken. They are so lost. And if you ask them these three questions, one out of the three or possibly all three of the questions they have no answer for. If you ask them, who are you? They don't have a clear understanding of who they are. If you ask me who I am, I'll tell you that I am a king. I am the son of the king of kings, God who created me. I'm created in his image and his likeness. The Holy Spirit has infilled me, and I am an important person. I'm filled with confidence, irregardless of my situation. I've been blessed in many different ways, but I'm not confident because of my blessing. I'm confident because of my blessor. God has provided in many different ways, but I'm not confident in the provision. I'm confident in the provider. So because I have an understanding of who God is, I have an identity that is established. So if you ask a person who they are, I don't know. That is a sign that you're going to have some problems. So it's very important if you don't know who you are, is to begin to study and to ask God to show you who you are. Because that brings an establishment within you that you can begin to master your emotions. And your emotions can become tools that help you as opposed to becoming um, weapons that destroy you. So the second question you have to ask is, is, is where do you belong? And, this, and this, is, this is a hard question in some sense because if you're in a family that's not accepting you and you're on your own, if you're not in a church community and you're just living day by day with yourself, um, even if you have a strong belief in yourself and you have a strong belief in God, when you don't have a community, it becomes very, 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 very hard. And I think, and I think the enemy oftentimes attacks your community, attacks your family to cause frustration between you and family members. So, so you say to yourself, man, I'm not talking to those people anymore. And then you have a church community. And oftentimes the enemy will attack you in your church community. And you say, man, I'm not going to church anymore. And the funny thing about it is that like this, when it comes to my family, it's very hard to find another family. Because um, it's like, that's where you're born. These are your people. But when it comes to church, and I'm not advocating that you leave from church to church, but I'm saying that if you were in a very hostile and a very negative community of people, um, you can leave and find a better community. Because there are so many churches that are out there. Um, some are good, some are bad. But if you look long enough, you'll find a good group of people who are loving, who just want to follow God, who just want to serve God. But you need to have a place to belong. Because when you have a place to belong, you can share your gift. Um, when you have a place to belong, you can receive other people's gifts that will help to build you up, that, can, that will help to, you know, cause you to have a, a measure of, a, of like fellowship. And sometimes you even have to press along even beyond church because sometimes we have a good church, but the demographic of the church doesn't really fit us. So I might have a good church and everybody in the church is teenagers. I'm not a teenager, so that doesn't really work in hanging out with people, but it's a good church, good pastor, good community. So I have fellowship there. You know, that's good. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to have a community. So sometimes you might have to find like a prayer group or find a community group of people who are also Christians and connect with them. Or even on YouTube, I know a lot of people who are Christian YouTubers connect with each other and talk with each other and they're able to have a fellowship with somebody from their own um, thought process, someone from their own age group, um, because I think that it's really, really a blessing to have that. I've said hello to so many of our people who are here today. I wanted to give a shout out to Blessing. It's wonderful to have you. Um, you wrote here, good one, brother. Thank you for sharing. Keep up the good work. I appreciate the encouragement. This is actually, I didn't even talk about, this is actually my first live stream, my first live stream on YouTube. And I went into a really deep topic today, but I would love to hear your thoughts on, on what, what are emotions. And um, we're talking about what emotions are and what feelings are from a biblical perspective. What are emotions? So, so, so we've, had, we've had quite a talk so far, 
And I'm so thankful for everyone who has um, just sat back and listened. But feel free to you know, introduce yourself to others who are here. Feel free to just share any questions that you have or any thoughts that you have so we can talk a little bit more on the subject matter. And at the same time, even though emotions do have a very, very good aspect to them, um, they also do have negative aspects. And I think that sometimes um, where it becomes really, really challenging is in all of my conversation, we still need more clarity about what exactly emotions are. I think the reason why a lot of times in church we tell people to ignore their emotions is because we let our emotions rule us. So if I wake up in the morning and I don't feel like going to work, depending on, on some of our mentality, some of us will call in sick and just lie down and we're not sick. Um, for others, you know, if, if, if you have a thought process that somebody did you bad, even if you have no evidence, even if you don't even know if it's true, you'll go right up to their face and you'll tell them off, you'll tell them your thoughts. And um, at the end of the day, that kind of pattern of life is not going to help you. There's a reason why, why Jesus said to forgive um, those who, who persecute you and those who misuse you is because you create problems in your life the more you fight. There's a time to fight, yes, but the time to fight is not every day. And it's very important for us to get to a place where as we expand our understanding on emotions, that we can use emotions to motivate us to get things done for God. So I woke up this morning feeling really tired, um, saying to myself, I'll just live stream next week. You know, thought process, all these things go through your mind to kind of dissuade you from doing the thing that you feel you should do. But at the end of the day, what happens is that I wake up, and I begin to generate in my thoughts and imagination that I'm going to come online and I'm just going to share what's in my heart. And I believe that what's in my heart is really there to help people because it's like God's been impressing on me that we need more clarity as it relates to the scriptures. The scriptures are not that complicated. If you slow down and read them, they're as clear as day. But sometimes, because of, 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 of people's own biases or people's own discomfort, they read over things and they ignore things because it makes them feel more comfortable. It's easier for me to say to you to ignore your emotions when I myself am having difficulty managing my emotions. But the proper thing for us to do, not just with emotions, but with everything in our life, is to put them at the altar of God and ask God to use these things to transform our life, to use these things to help our life. There's a lot I can say about emotions, but I think I'm going to close on just talking about um, this concept, and then I'll go through the five emotions one more time. And um, if you feel, if you have any questions, feel free to um, write them in the comment section, to write them on the message board, because we'd love to hear from you. We're going to talk a little bit more about emotions moving forward. But to me, one of the biggest paradigm shifts for me when it comes to emotions is this particular concept, this particular concept, is that emotions are not teachers. Emotions are not meant to teach us anything. Emotions are not leaders. Emotions were not meant to lead us anywhere. Emotions ultimately, and, and you might challenge me on this one, but ultimately emotions are not tools of discernment. So because I feel uncomfortable with you, doesn't mean that, you know, God is discerning through me, you're, you're a bad or good person. Emotions serve pretty much two roles. Two roles. And when we can get these two roles down packed, then it causes us to have the ability to better manage our emotions. The two roles that emotions have is that emotions, number one, are an expression of our thought process. 
Emotions are an expression of our thought process. So if I'm sitting down wondering, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to pay the bills? You know, a lot of times people pray, and when they pray, um, God doesn't answer. Does God really answer prayers? Is God real? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I mold it through my mind over and over and over again. What will happen is I will produce the feeling of fear on the inside of me. If I produce the feeling of fear on the inside of me, then um, it's not coming from a fear that will build me up. It's coming from a fear that will actually break me down. So it's very, very important for us to understand that when it comes to emotions, emotions are the manifestation of our thinking. So because emotions are the manifestation of our thinking, we have to begin to think differently if we want to experience life differently. You see, sadness in appreciation to someone that you lost, it, it's difficult. But when it comes from a heart of appreciation, it won't destroy you. Fear for the purpose of survival is not bad because it will wake me up and make me go to work. But if I'm fearful over things that are not there, then it's going to destroy my life. I, I don't want to be too much longer, so I'm just going to move into the second one. Is I said, the first thing is that um, emotions are an expression of our thinking. But I think the biggest aspect of emotions that we are missing is that emotions are alarms. Emotions are alarms. And because most of us are not connected to um, our spiritual life in the way that we should be, to be able to decipher God's voice, to decipher the devil's voice, to decipher human voice, to decipher my own selfish voice, because we don't have that clarity sometimes, we don't recognize that emotions are actually alarms. So let's look through um, the five emotions from a positive alarm perspective. If I can't pay my rent and fear comes on the inside of me, that's a good thing because it's reminding me that I have to pay my rent. If I can't pay my rent and I feel calm and I feel good and I'm like, ah, oh, man, something's going to work out. And I do that and the rent is due in 10 days. And, and on the 10th day, I'm going to be in trouble. So fear elicits a thought in me to get myself out of the situation. When it comes to anger, um, anger is an alarm that I am offended. If I'm offended because you did not recognize me, I'm offended because you did not appreciate me, I'm offended because you did not bow to me, then I recognize that I have a problem. The problem that I have is pride because my offense is an alarm that your expectations are not being met. But when you look at your expectations, your expectations are not reasonable. Change them. Then if we look at the thought of disgust, disgust is an alarm that your life is not going the way that you want it to go. Now, if you're doing all kinds of things that are against Christianity and you want to be a Christian, you're going to become disgusted with yourself. But instead of living in that, you have to recognize that this feeling is an alarm calling me to change, to change my behavior, to change my life so that my life can be transformed. Um, all of these alarms, you can look at from a positive or a negative perspective. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are alarms and they're calling you to look at your life. They're calling you to change. Sadness is an alarm that I've lost something. And I need to recognize the thing that I've lost. Some of the things that we've lost are precious things. But when that alarm comes on, it's now time to appreciate the thing that I've lost and to learn from that situation. If you have lost one parent, that's a horrible feeling. But the alarm now shows you to be thankful for the second parent, especially when you have two good parents. Because sometimes when you have good parents, you don't really 
um, think as much of how you should show kindness to them. But sadness is an alarm to pay attention to something that you've lost. And then lastly, happiness. Happiness when it is placed in the right place. It comes from living a life of purpose for God, living in the community with God and with God's people. And it comes from having the proper understanding of who you are, having a great confidence. That your confidence is not found in the likes and the subscriptions. Your confidence is not found in, in people saying nice things about you. Your confidence is not found about in your bank account, nor is it even found upon the opportunities that you have that you get to preach around the world or you get to have a beautiful job with a lot of money. Your confidence is not found in that. Your confidence is found in God. And when you can have a happiness because of that, then you know your life is transformed. So happiness is an alarm to tell you if you have achieved the goal that you desire. So if I'm walking with God and I'm happy, that's good. If my happiness is found in what car I'm driving, you know, my happiness is found in like, you know, what girl I'm dating or what guy I'm dating. My happiness is found in what clothes I'm wearing. You're going to have to reevaluate your goals and to have something that's higher. So at the end of the day, I want to just thank everybody that's here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, we'd love to hear from you. But also, I wanted to say that we're going to continue on this vein of just talking about emotions and talking about the power of emotions. Later on, we're going to be talking about, um, in our message ther series, we're going to be talking about how to utilize our emotions to push us forward. And also, I think I'm going to probably do um, another talk on some of our negative emotions because I'm talking more so when you're in a place of controlling your emotions. Sometimes fear gets you to the place that you lose control. Sometimes anger gets you to the place that you lose control. Sometimes disgust and sadness get you to the place that you lose control. And sometimes happiness is in pleasure and is not in God. So we want to be able to rightly divide the word and to basically get our hearts and our minds in line with God's purpose. So I want to thank you for just being a part of this um, talk that today. And I'm so happy to just have all of you who are here. I appreciate you. And I want to encourage you to just connect with each other and to um, like, subscribe, and comment on my page and also if you see anyone else here that you get to know, you like to know, and they're also on YouTube, please feel free to connect with them because we're a community. I'm so thankful for our community. And for those of you who are watching this on the rebroadcast, I'm so thankful for you. You've supported our channel so greatly. We are on our march toward um, just growing. We've had a wonderful year on YouTube and I'm happy. I'm happy. So today I'm happy, I'm hoping that you will be happy moving forward. And we know that at the end of the day, God is good to us. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank you.